All right, here we are working on the in-class problems for chapter 20 in Business 371. And let me just bring in the uh, the questions. We've got eight and nine here, so you might want to take a screen capture. The uh, questions are eight, nine, eleven. Whoops, uh, eight, nine, eleven, and fourteen. So here you can see three of them here. Eight is uh, credit terms. 11 is uh, credit policy, doing the calculation of the one-time order and the repeat order, and solving for the break-even probability of default. And then number 11, we've got economic order quantity. And then number 14 down here, we have uh, a calculation of credit policy evaluation to determine whether or not it's a good idea. So uh, you took those screen captures. You're good to go. Otherwise, you can look at them in your uh, McGraw Hill textbook or ebook. So let's begin. First question, number eight says the Thaddy Corporation sells on credit terms of net 30. So let's write down here, eight. All right. <laughs> okay, so their uh, credit terms are net 30, and uh, the accounts are on average uh, four days past due, so it takes them about 34 days. To collect because it's 30 days of their normal credit terms plus four days past due, that's 34. Annual credit sales are 9.75 million. What is the company's balance sheet am amount in accounts receivable? I assume 365 days per year. Well, uh, we're basically solving for the uh, average receivables, and we know that accounts receivable turnover. Whoops. <laughs> is equal to. Uh, sales over accounts receivable, average accounts receivable. I'm having a hard time with that forward slash here. Okay, there we go. And uh, we know that the average collection period is equal to 365 divided by accounts receivable. Turnover. Oops. Hmm. So let's put some brackets around that just for those of you who are going to say, ah, how do I do that calculation? All right. So uh, here we have uh, we have sales. So let's go back up here. We uh, know that the accounts receivable turnover. The average collection period is 30 days. So, um, where do we want to start? Equals 30 days. Whoops. Ah, problem with this formula. Of course, there is. I don't have a formula. Let's go on to the next one. <laughs> is equal to uh, 30 days. We know that from what's stated in the question. And uh, so. The accounts receivable, whoops, 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 so what do we need to calculate here? We have 30 is equal to uh, 365 over ARTO. So a little algebra tells us that 30, uh, let's cross multiply. We end up with uh, accounts receivable. Let's just go to turnover tab equals tab is equal to 365 divided by 30. So basically you just swap the accounts receivable turnover number and the 30. So 365 divided by 30. And that equals 10.73529, just like that. And now up here, let's give myself some Give ourselves a little bit more room. Let's just insert some lines here. There we go. Now we know that we know the amount of sales, and uh, we know the accounts receivable turnover now. So now we know that 10.73529 is equal to sales, which is 9.75 million divided by average accounts receivable. And so we can solve for 
the average accounts receivable. You know what? I think I'm wrong here. I think this is 34. I think I did the calculation correctly. But it, uh, <laughs> remember it's equal to their, whoops, 30 day collection period, or 30 day terms, plus their four extra days. So, yeah. So 365 divided by 34, and I think that's right. Uh, we can actually do the calculation over here if you like. So we go equals 365 divided by 34. There you go. We'll use the uh, the Excel itself. So we can just pick up that number over here. And so if we're solving for average accounts receivable, once again we're once again we're going to cross multiply. So, oops. It's, uh, doing that. So it's going to be uh, 9.75 divided by. So nine seven five zero 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 zero. Let's check to see whether that's got the right number of zeros in it. Yes, it does. Okay, good. So let's adjust. Let's go equals that number divided by. Well, that number right there. That'll work. 908.219, and if you need a more, couple more decimals, you can go this way. 908.219.18. And that's the answer to the first question. So let's highlight that. There we go. Beautiful shade of yellow. All right, so that's the first question. Next question, number nine. We're evaluating credit policy. And so um, we need to uh, well, read, the, read the required. The first required is assuming this is a one-time order, should it be filled, the customer will not buy if credit is not extended. And then what is the break-even probability of default? And then suppose that customers don't, who don't default become repeat custom, customers who place the same order every period forever. Should the order be filled? And what is the break-even probability of default in that case? And then describe in general terms why credit terms will be more liberal when repeat orders are a possibility. Remember from the PowerPoints, repeat customer was worth 5050 and a single time customer was worth $42. That would be that Y right there. So in general terms, it's much more profitable to have repeat customers. All right, so where do we begin? Well, we need to figure out what V, all the parameters are V, pi, the probability of default, V is the uh, cost of each unit, and uh, P is the price paid, and uh, the uh, the interest rate R for the period. So here we're talking about uh, wholesaler, the stocks, engine components, and test equipment for the commercial aircraft industry. Uh, new customers pay, place an order for eight high bypass turbine engines. And but we're asking a general question: Should a customer, a one-time order, uh, should the customer uh, be granted credit? So let's calculation. Let's do the calculation for one bypass engine as opposed to eight, because then the numbers get really, really, really big. The variable cost is 1.6 million per unit. So that's going to be our variable cost, V, uh, V as in Victor. The credit price is 1.725 million each. So that's the price, P. Credit is ex extended for one period and based on historical experience, payment for about one out of every 200 such orders is never collected. So one out of 100 would be 1%, one out of every 200 is half a percent. So half a percent don't pay. And the required return is 1.8% per period. So, let's uh, move the question aside here. We have V, whoops, okay, V equals, boy, I'm having a hard time with my tab key today. Uh, 1.6 million, 1 million 600,000, like that. You do that, Excel keeps it. And then we have pi, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to write pi, so let's make it, uh, I don't know, little p. How about we'll just write pi. How's that?
the probability default is uh, equals one out of every 200. <laughs> Did I mention I was having trouble with my... There we go. Except that's not 200. Equals one divided by 200 divided by 200. 0 0.005, half a percent. And then the price. Okay, just P, backspace. Equals. The price is 1.725 million. 1, 725, 0, 0, like that. And then R, the rate of return, is, uh, it says it is 1.8%, uh, 0.018. So A asks us, what is the net present value of a one-time customer? And you will remember from the uh, PowerPoint slides, it's minus V plus 1, 1, 1 minus phi, phi times P divided by brackets 1 plus Okay, so we can make that go away by putting in a little apostrophe at the beginning. Okay, so in this case, that's going to be equal to um, minus that one there, plus in brackets, one minus <laughs> one minus that one there times that one there divided by in brackets one one plus that one there close brackets and we're good eighty six thousand twenty six point five two per unit then B says what is the break-even probability of default so in that case, we're going to set 0 equal to, all right, backspace, tab, that same expression. Let's just copy it. And then we're going to solve for everything except for pi. So minus. One comma six zero zero comma zero 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 plus one 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 minus point zero zero five times one comma seven two five comma zero 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 divided by one point zero one eight and of course we have to go back to the beginning and tell Excel, but it's we don't really mean that as a number. All right, except uh, of course we want this to be a general statement. So now we have to put in pi here as the general statement. Okay, good. And then we need to solve for pi. So we want pi is going to be equal to. Uh, we can actually do the calculation here. Uh, 1.75725 over 1 1.018. Uh, so if we... Uh, let me... There's a couple ways I can do this. Uh, one, I can actually solve this general expression for pi. That might be the e easiest way to do it. So why don't we do it that way? Uh, I'm going to go up there. Shift there, copy all of that, and bring it down here. And then um, we are going to uh, put V on this side. <laughs> oh boy. All right. 
So v. So we basically added v to both sides. And now we have that equal to. <laughs> I'm remarkably consistent. You'd think I'd learn from this once in a while. Uh, okay, so now we're just copy that. Control that. Copy that. Now we're trying to solve for pi. So what we have done there is we have taken the v and put it on the other side. So that's our new expression. Okay. And now let's uh, take this expression over here, the p times 1 plus r, and we'll move that to the other side as well. So we have v times... Um, and of course, we, in order to get it from the uh, right-hand side to the other side, we need to invert and multiply. So it's one plus r Oops. divided by the price. Oh, we're going to need to do this bit of expansion here. There we go, and that is going to be equal to one minus pi pi. And then, of course, we can just uh, uh, we can uh, rewrite that as pi. Is equal to uh, so we basically add pi to both sides and subtract uh, the left hand side from one. So let's grab this. We'll copy that and we'll put that over here. And then I'm going to put a one minus before. It. One, one minus all of that. I guess we don't need brackets because bed mass will tell us that. Correct. Okay. So, all right. So that's the algebra. Uh, so uh, let's see. We're going to type it in here. So it equals one minus that one right there times, in brackets, 1, 1 plus the r right there, uh, divided by the price p right there. Works out to 0 0.0557681116, or 5.58%. So the default probability, uh, any less than 6% of the people uh, default. Uh, we are, we're good. So the default probability 0 0.0558. Um, you'll notice that unlike the example in the PowerPoint, 1.6 million to 1.725, there's only $125,000 of profit in each turbine engine that we sell them. Um, one thing to consider is the fact that we are in the example it says we're going to we're going to sell them eight high bypass turbine engines so uh, these two would be higher by eight and uh, so we would actually take this net present value and multiply it by eight because each of these would be eight times the amount yeah so because the V would be 8V and the P would be 8P. We could actually factor out the 8 and uh, just get the same the same result. So, so it should work. Okay, so that was uh, A and B. And then C asks us, what if this uh, customer is a repeat customer? In which case, you will remember from the slide, that it's minus V. It's apostrophe minus minus v, v plus again 1 minus pi you know what I'm just going to copy it and adjust it so let's go grab this one copy that it's almost the same formula except for the fact that the, the little piece in here which was just the price becomes the price minus the uh, variable cost and then it's a perpetuity so we don't need to do that anymore uh, so let's do the calculation so once again we have minus that number up there plus 
one, one minus that number right up there, bracket, times, bracket, that number minus that number divided by that number. So that works out to quite a number. Let's uh, put a few decimals in there. Okay, 5,309,722. And let's put some decimals in there. 86026. So it's uh, worth 5.3 million to have a repeat customer for these engines. And of course, we multiply that by 5. Uh, so for 8. <laughs> by 5. Uh, listen to yourself. Uh, so <laughs> 8 is going to be 8 times that amount. So we have a repeat customer, that's like 42, uh, 42 million, 42 and a half million dollars for eight. And let's copy that and put it up here and see what it is. It's 688,000 for a repeat customer of eight uh, high bypass turbine engines. We're not quite done because it asks us again to calculate the break even probability of default. Uh, it asks this question. Should the order be <laughs> should the order be filled? Well, it's forty-two and a half million dollars. If you can get by without that, I guess you don't need to fill the order. But that sounds like a really good idea in terms of the profitability of your company. We uh, can do essentially the same thing as we did here. And so I'm just going to pull that proof down and put it here, and then slightly adjust it for the fact that it's a slightly different formula. So let's uh, grab that formula and put it here and then the next step was to take V over there and then uh, on this side our formula is going to have the contribution margin here and it's going to be a perpetuity Oops. and then uh, the next line 1 minus pi so we need to uh, change this slightly. So the R is by itself and it's divided by the contribution margin like that. And then pi is going to move over to this side and we're going to have 1 minus this piece which we can put in like that. All right, so it's asking us what is the uh, the break-even repeat customer probability, and so we can just do that calculation. Whoops, <laughs> not yet. All right, so there we go. We have equals one minus that variable cost up there times that R right there divided by in brackets that minus whoops minus the variable cost and so that works out to 0.7696 so 76.9% 6% even if 77% of our customers defaulted it's still worth us finding that other 23% because that other 23% is worth 42 million dollars or an 8, eight order or 5.3 million dollars per customer so, uh, describe in general terms why credit terms will be more liberal when repeat orders are a possibility. Well, here we have, it is assumed that if a person has paid his or who, her bills in the past, they will pay their bills in the future. This implies that if someone doesn't default when credit is first granted, then they will be a good customer far into the future. And the possible gains from the future business outweighs the possible losses from granted granting credit the first time. Or in a word, 42.5 million dollars. That would be a fairly strong argument to support the uh, granting of credit. All right, we need uh, number 11 as well. So here we're going to scroll right on past and do number 11. All right, so here is number 11, the question. 
Number 11, Odium Manufacturing uses 2,800 switch assemblies per week and then reorders another 2,800. If the relevant carrying cost per switch assembly is 620, the fixed order cost is 1,200. Uh, is Odium's inventory policy optional? Opti op optimal, not optional, optimal. Why or why not? All right. So, the uh, formula was that Q star equals uh, the square root of 2F Ft over Cc like that. So we need to figure out what F's and T's and CC's are. So F is the uh, the fixed cost per order which it gave us as uh, 1200. Then T is the total units per year and so we sell 2800 per week. So Those 2800 times the 52 weeks in a year so 145,600 is the total amount. CC, the carrying cost, is uh, $6.20. So we can calculate the economic order quantity. Whoops. Uh, shift down back. There we go. Uh, SQRT is actually the uh, the formula, so we need to put an equal sign in, don't we? Yeah. S Q. There we go. Oops, it doesn't like that. Okay, let's try that again. Equals square root of two times F times T divided by C C close the brackets. 7507. 7507. So, is it optimal to order them every time you get below 2800? Well, no. No, it isn't. We should, uh, uh, the, the the, the solution says the firm's policy is not optimal since the carrying costs and the ordering co order costs are not equal. The company should increase the order size and decrease the number of orders. So we should uh, order at 7507 instead of 2800. One more question. 14. 14. Question 14 is down here. It says, the Berry Corporation is considering a change in its cash only policy. New terms would be net one period based on the following information. Determine if Berry should proceed or not. Required return 2.5% per period. And we can see the price per unit is $73 under the current policy, $75 under the new policy. The cost doesn't change if we grant credit. So the unit sales go from $32.80 up to $33.90. So, is it worth doing? Well, uh, under the current policy, they get, uh, let's just write that out, current policy, uh, their cash flow, is uh, P minus V times Q. And the uh, current policy price is uh, 73 equals 73 minus the cost of 38 times the quantity of uh, 32.80. So that's how much money they bring in every period. <laughs> Doesn't say what the period is. So every period we bring in 114,800. The new policy also has cash flow 
equal to p minus v over q. But in this case, uh, p is 75. We can actually charge a little more. Still cost is 38. And we're selling 3,390 of those. So the cash flow goes up by the difference between those two. Uh, from 114,800 up to 125,430. Uh, we basically we are going to generate the difference between those per perpetually. So let's go benefit. Uh, perpetuity is that cash flow divided by, okay, so we know PV is equal to uh, C over R. Using a capital R for some reason. I guess I've carried over from the previous question. So in this case, we have the difference in cash flow. Whoops. The extra cash flow is going to be equal to uh, let's do brackets that minus that every period forever, which is worth 2.5% per period, so 0 0.025. So we're making an extra 425,200. Of course, it doesn't come without a cost. So what are the costs? Well, the cost is we're giving up that amount because uh, we, uh, well, so let's just go back here. Step. The cost is equal to minus the cost of the inventory. Oh, let's go philosophy because we want it to show up. Minus V, the variable cost, uh, times the number of new orders. Uh, I don't know. Let's, do, let's go D for delta Q, the change in the number of new orders, plus the uh, one month collection. So, uh, 114,800 here. So basically, it takes us a month longer to collect every 114,800. But we're increasing the benefit. So, what does that work out to be? Uh, well, <laughs> minus V is minus uh, 38 times the change in order economic order, or the, the economic order. Uh, 3390 minus 3280, we're selling that many more, plus 104, whoops. Uh, it's actually minus, because we've used that as well. No, didn't like something about the calculation. change this minus P P minus V P Q alright so P being the original one I suppose in order to be mathematically notational and all that let's uh, stick a couple of cells in here, and I'm going to take these and cut them and bring them up one more. And then I'm going to put equals, and I'm going to put P prime minus V times Q prime. And there, now my notation is kind of going to work. So instead of DQ here, we're going to put in uh, Q prime minus Q, and that should work. All right, so uh, hmm. let's uh, cut that and put it there, and let's put another equal sign after here. There, how's that look? Cool. So, we just need to add those two up. Okay. Add those two up.
two up. And so we need, like the accountants do, we need a top and bottom border. There we go. Put in some commas. There we go. Okay. So it's worth uh, 306,220 for us to do that. That's not what the solution says, so let me see what I did wrong. Okay, what I did wrong is, uh, is, is this part right here. Actually, we're giving up the collection, the PQ. So basically, we're giving up the uh, the fact that you know, this is this is the profit that we're making, the net cash flow. Uh, what we're giving up is one period of collection. So we're moving 100, not 114,800, but a substantial amount more. Uh, so let me just readjust this number. We want instead of that, we want it P times Q. And P, uh, the price per unit before, is 73 times the quantity we had before of 32.80. And that works out 181,050. So let's make these all the same. All right, so uh, once again, let's, let's take a quick look. The current policy means we are selling at P and paying V. And V doesn't change, but Q uh, does change. So we sell more units if we extend credit. But the price also goes up. So looking at this, the price is 73 or 3,280 units if we keep the same policy. If uh, we go to the new policy, we generate a higher price, 75, and we generate a higher Q, which is 3,390. The benefit of going to the new policy is the difference in cash flow between those two numbers. So H48 minus H44, let me just double click on it. So the blue one minus the red one, uh, the amount of cash flow we're going to get is 125 instead of 114. And that's going to go on forever, so we're discounting it at the discount rate of 0 0.025, which is the perpetuity rate of return. Of course, it doesn't come without a cost. So the cost is the uh, fact that we've got to generate, we've got to build $38 inventory, and we have to make an extra what is that 110, 110 units of inventory at $38 each, and uh, we have to build those and give them to them at the beginning of the month, and then we're going to push 73 times through 3280, the existing price and the existing unit sales, we're pushing all of that money forward one month forever or one period, doesn't actually say a month, one period forever. So we're getting 425,000 extra dollars. That's the value of getting an extra amount of sales every period forever. And uh, the cost is the cost of building uh, new inventory and of pushing off um, the, uh, the revenue, the monthly revenue, one period into the future every month for the rest of forever. So anyway, that's it for uh, for chapter 20. We are done. And uh, so that's all of those questions. Hope you enjoyed that. And uh, thanks for listening. Bye.